So thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm really grateful to be invited to find out more about the work that you guys are doing and to share a little bit about my own research on um, bioecological approaches to understanding um, children's development in the context of adversity and um, in, in the research I'm going to be talking about here, low income. And um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the idea of a bioecological model, so I probably don't need to describe it much, but um, just in case, um, the idea of a bioecological model is that children's develop, development happens in the context of a series of nested settings, with the most important impact being a most um, probably the most pronounced impact being on children, especially young children, from those experiences that are proximal to the child, their immediate relationships and contexts, that those are influenced by the settings in which those are situated, maybe like thinking of extended family or um, the school or child care setting, and those are influenced by a broader context like neighborhood or school systems, local politics, and those are influenced by broader social, um, macroeconomic, um, societal level factors. So you all know that probably, but what I think about when I see that model, I know when it was originally proposed and we continue to think about these bi-directional associations, moderated and mediated effects going both ways across system levels. But in my experience working in communities and with state agencies as those influences really start at the macro level, it's very hard, not impossible for, um, for the more proximal factors to influence more distal factors, and most of the influence happens from distal factors to more proximal factors, um, or at least those are heavy influences on families. But what that points to is that if these are downstream causal pathways from distal influences to proximal influences on children's development, then we're going to see what tends to be a clustering effect, right? We're going to see clustering of advantage and protective factors, um, and similarly we'll see a clustering or a co-occurring of um, risk or adversity factors. And that's where my interest lies, is the impact of this clustering, a co-occurring risk that happens in a child's life because of these nested settings, distal factors having impact on proximal um, factors in a child's life. Um, then when, you, when bio got added to the bioecological model, Bron Frenner did that after maybe the first 20 years of his model. I can't remember when he added that. Um, we really start to recognize that the child, him or herself, the ontogenic system, is a system of interdependent and interrelated um, indicators or um, processes or systems of well-being. And so we're trying to capture that in, this, in our research where we try to recognize the um, interrelatedness among physical or physiological stress measures or indicators, um, indicators of social, emotional well-being and academic um, competence. So when I think about those two things, when I think about this kind of complexity of causal models, um, it's downstream effects of distal to proximal effects, and then this interdependence of um, indicators of a child's well-being, um, then um, it doesn't necessarily surprise us or shouldn't surprise us when we think about a very widespread and long-term impact of experiences of adversity, particularly economic disadvantage on children's lives. So when we think about indicators of a child's well-being, almost every single thing we can think of as an indicator of well-being is touched by poverty. We see higher rates of physical health problems, particularly chronic health problems like obesity and asthma. We see higher rates of, of learning disabilities and cognitive delays. Um, certainly we know there's um, discrepancies or disparities in academic, um, in school readiness and in achieving um, reading standards in fourth grade, higher rates of being held back or expelled, and um, kids who grow up in poverty are six times more likely to be, to be dropping out of high school. We see a higher um, likelihood of social, emotional, or mental health problems. And then if you're thinking about this developmentally, how these are probably building on each other, um, or cascading into um, a pretty long list of problems that um, are more likely to emerge in adolescents or teens who have grown up in poverty. So the rate of teen birth is three times that, kids not in poverty. Um, only about a third of teens who have a child while they're a teen ever go back and finish high school. Um, Two-thirds don't. So you can imagine that that leaves them um, 
socioeconomically um, disadvantaged through their adulthood as well. Um, their own children are more likely to have school and behavioral problems. Um, kids who grew up in poverty are more likely to be economically inactive um, by the time they're young adults, so that means either not in school or not working, um, and a higher likelihood of um, themselves living in poverty in adulthood. So we see this kind of long-term, widespread, almost cascading or like building blocks effect of adversity that comes out of growing up in poverty. Um, and so when I think about the mechanisms of that, the, what, you know, the whys of that, I'm going back to this bioecological model and this accumulation of risk um, or burden of risk. So even though poverty might, or um, being at or near poverty is defined by some income cutoff. So we think of it often, or many people think of it often as simply um, having low resources um, or unstable economic resources. It's really um, not just that. It, that's only a small part of the experience of poverty. Um, what we see are a very high co-occurrence with a number of other risk factors. So single parents are four times as likely to be living in poverty than um, a household that has two adults. Um, adolescent parents, about 80% of them are probably getting some kind of public aid, um, so living at or near poverty. Um, and as I said before, if you're a young um, parent, you're not likely to achieve as high educational attainment. Um, in general, just lower educational attainment, more residential instability, higher rates of crowding or homelessness or inadequate housing, higher likelihood of just stressful negative life events happening, higher likelihood of being in a risky neighborhood, having poor access to healthcare, higher rates of mental health and substance use. So this context, this marker of poverty is really a marker for this whole host of risk factors. Any one of these alone is associated with higher rates of social, emotional, or mental health problems in kids. Um, so just, um, just taking, we, we could study any one of them, and, and in fact, people are articulating or arguing it's really important to understand the individual effects of individual risk factors, and I completely agree. Like, understanding the effects of neighborhood risk or maternal depression is really important. And understanding that these rarely occur in isolation, understanding that any one of these is associated with a burden of risk, a lot of overwhelming risk, um, is an important part of understanding the impact of ki on kids as well. So when I say any one of these is associated with higher rates of problems, being a teen, having a teen parent is associated with a greater risk for abuse, having a parent with mental health or substance use problems has higher rates of kids who end up in foster care or homeless. Um, but we know that, just as an example, cumulative risk is a more robust predictor of risk for abuse than some of the things that other people have looked at, like attachment status or things like that. So we know that this is a powerful, it's powerful to understand these cumulative risk in kids' lives. Um, and these are data from a study that I'll, um, I'll be talking about in just a minute, but I just wanted to use this to illustrate that idea. So we looked at, and this is a sample that I have of 300 families um, in our um, King County area in Washington. And um, we looked at the correlation of income, we, um, the full range of income to cumulative risk, and it's like 0.61, so um, pretty substantial, that lower income is related to higher risk. Um, and then when I d divide out our sample by income categories, this is middle to upper income, just being at the median income of our region, of our area, um, or above, so I'm not really looking at uh, like what we think of as middle income families, but really just median income and above. Um, the vast majority of those families um, have no risk, none of these risk factors, or at most one. one. But as you go down this income level and you start looking at families in poverty, the most of those families have one, two, or more risk factors. Um, so again, it's just a marker, not just for the low-income part of that, but for the accumulation of other risk factors. Um, so there's, um, I don't know, something like 50 years of research that has been looking at what used to be called multiple risk, now cumulative risk. And you know the, the consistency of the finding is pretty profound in that it um, almost always shows um, that as the number of risk factors go up, you see higher risk or likelihood of problems. It's a generally thought to be a linear association. And um, you could put almost, almost any child outcome on this um, um, y-axis. Uh, early on, it was studied as 
um, a cumulative risk or multiple risk effects on health outcomes in, in kids. Um, and became mental health outcomes, social, emotional, academic, and you can pretty much um, put anything on that y-axis. And so when I was thinking about and what guided our research in this area was what could be, what could be some of the underlying dis um, disruptions that are accounting for these widespread impacts, this impact on just about any other social, emotional outcome in kids. And so we formulated our study to be thinking about, our research to be thinking about whether disruptions to core aspects of kids' self-regulation um, neurobiologically based stress sensitive self-regulation systems could be underlying many of the widespread adverse outcomes cumulative risk is having on kids. So that was one um, area of research that was, or area that was guiding the research that we did. The other thing that guided the research we did was um, some evidence from a review from a long time ago. Um, almost 20 years ago, that at least half the effects of, of poverty on young children are accounted for by things in the house, in the family. Um, so we decided to really try to focus on what could be happening in the family that would help either us account for the effects of low income on child outcomes, but also help us identify potential modifiable um, mechanisms or mediators or moderators that um, could be then targets of intervention. So we, look, if you take that bioecological model and stretch it out into a causal model, we laid out the idea that low income and the accumulation of risk associated with it would then have an impact on proximal influences on the child, um, things in the house. It can be in fact impacting other things as well, like childcare settings and stuff, but we were focused primarily on parenting in this research. I, I don't know where my pointer is. But um, that, those, uh, that parenting in particular in this study would in turn uh, mediate and account for some of the effects of income and cumulative risk and shape children's self-regulation, which I'll define in just a minute, and um, that these would have then impact on a number of um, indicators of child um, outcome or well-being in early childhood, and then you would see that cascading of effects into adolescence um, later on. So in this study, the data I'm going to talk about today, we've, we have um, data on our kids through the um, start of kind of at kindergarten readiness or kindergarten start. So fifth, five, they're about five and a half um, in the data I'll talk about today. But we went on to measure our kids when they were eight. And now we're, um, as part of a different study, collecting data on them at 11. So we're getting closer to that adolescent period. I've been trying to get funding to pick up the kids right here in pre-adolescence, early adolescence. And, for some reason, NIACHD doesn't like anything I'm submitting lately. So if you guys have any ideas, I'm open to them. Um, anyway, so I'll be talking about this first part of the model mostly today. OK, the data I'm going to talk about come from a study that we called Project 123 Go. It's actually two projects that were closely related. The first was a small sort of pilot or preliminary study with 103-year-olds that we followed for six months. Um, and then we went on to use that data to collect a bigger data set of 300 kids that we've um, assessed once every nine months for um, two and a half years. So starting when they were three and ending when they were five and a half. Um, we explicitly were testing the impact, the relation of income to effortful control and aspect of self-regulation. So it was really important to have a full range of income with um, good representation at all levels of income. So it was, um, pretty equally represented across levels of income. And then the ethnic and racial composition of the sample pretty much reflects the Seattle King County area. Well, although when we overrepresent lower income, we also are slightly overrepresenting families of color in the region. Self-regulation. I don't know about you guys, we've had some conversations over last night and today about how frustrating this term can be. It means a lot of things. It's a lot of different things to different people. So we were trying to really, um, folk, we, we measured three aspects of self-regulation. This was explicitly a study of the development of effortful control. And I'll say in a minute that this is closely related to executive control. But I was really curious and interested about other indicators that are potentially stress sensitive indicators of emotion and um, neuro, you know, neuroendocrine stress responses that might in turn impact effortful control. So we also measured HPA axis um, indicator cortisol and RSA. So like I just said, we were looking for 
things that had a basis in a neurobiological system that would be stress sensitive, that were relevant predictors of children's adaptive outcomes from other research, so we weren't doing anything new in um, looking at them in terms of outcomes. Um, and that could be potential mechanisms of the effects of adversity on kids. But what I particularly was interested in is whether um, uh, neuroendocrine stress responses and emotion regulation as indicated by RSA could disrupt effortful control development over time. So I'm gonna talk about all of our indicators of self-regulation pretty quickly. Um, I'm open to questions or clarifications as I go. I don't know how familiar these terms are to everybody. So um, do you guys have as many debates here as we do back at our house about um, executive control versus effortful control? I don't know if this is even an arena for you guys. So, okay, good. So there's no controversy. Um, <laughs> so here I switched to executive control and I will refer to it that way going forward. So effortful control is this construct that comes out of the temperament literature and that was the first roots of my research. Individual differences is in, in this child's executive-based self-regulation um, that uh, we've shown um, can really differentiate kids who are vulnerable or resilient in the face of stress. And so we were really interested in what shapes this and what role does experience play in shaping this type of self-regulation. And it is often characterized as having two dimensions an executive component and a motivational component. So delay of gratification, you guys have all heard the marshmallow task, right? Where kids have to wait for more reward. So that delay component is often included in effortful control and we are excluding it because it seems in our preschool kids to operate really different than this executive control. The executive control represents activity in the prefrontal cortex and we were very narrow in defining it as being attention focusing, being able to sustain your attention on the thing that you're supposed to sustain it on, attention shifting, being able to shift your attention away from distracting information to the relevant information, inhibitory control, inhibiting an automatic or prepotent response to produce a more appropriate or correct response, and flexibility to be able to shift between your attention between um, and, and your um, control between different rules or different expectations. So if anyone cares about what neuropsych tests we used, there's a list, they're the very common ones. Um, we tried to create a battery that would be easy for, have parts that were easy for little kids and then hard for them. There would be parts that would be hard for little kids but they would grow into those tasks. So that's where some of the NFC tasks came from. Um, are people familiar with preschool measures of executive control? So two common ones that are out there are day night and we call it monkey dragon because we found a cute monkey, um, but in the literature it's bear dragon because most people use a bear. In day and night, it's a downward extension of a stroop task. So um, in um, this one, when a child is shown a card of a sun, they're told to say um, night. And when they're shown a card that shows them a picture of a moon, they are told to say day. So they're trying to produce a conflicting or non-dominant response. Um, Monkey, dra oops, monkey dragon is like a Simon Says task, so they do whatever the monkey tells them to, but not what the unfriendly dragon tells them to. So it's inhibiting a response when they're told to do something. Um, here is our growth of executive control across this preschool period that we were studying. And in, my, in, in, in conceiving this study, here's what I thought I'd see. I thought I'd see small, not very marked differences at three that grew bigger because of experiences. The three to six period is when people were thinking executive control is really developing dramatically. So in a period where it's developing and you're having adverse experiences, I thought it would divert its development. That is not at all what we found. We found that kids showed um, significant differences, moderate differences at the start of our study at three that were sustained in relation to income were sustained the entire three to five period. So I, um, I realized suddenly that I caught these kids too late, right? <laughs> we needed to study them earlier to catch what processes were leading to these differences in the first place. Um, in, and I'll tell you in a minute that we did find parenting is related to different trajectories, but income was not. That income differences were there at three and stayed the whole time. So then I was interested in what in the child's stress responses and their emotional responses might contribute to disruption in the development of this executive control. And we looked at cortisol, which is an indicator of the HPA axis activity. 
And I was really trying to target um, an indicator of the regulation of that child's system, so like a basal level of regulation. A lot of people are studying reactivity to an emotional listening task or a socially stressful task. I think that's also valuable information. But I was thinking that income and cumulative risk as stable risk factors would be shaping the very basal regulation of these systems. So we were looking at diurnal patterns of cortisol. Um, Diurnal patterns of cortisol, again, I don't know how familiar this is to people, follow a pretty typical pattern where you see people have their highest levels in the morning. They drop off really quickly until, at a, until about 10 or noon in the day and then continue to taper off. We only have two measurements in the morning at night, so we get this higher in the morning, low at night, typical profile. Um, people often think that stress is associated with elevations in cortisol. And that's probably true for like very brief short-term experiences of stress. We had only a few kids in either of our samples. This is the data for our smaller sample, um, but similar distribution in our bigger sample. Only very few kids, 5%, 4% in our other sample, have what we would say is high elevations throughout their day. Um, and we couldn't find in either sample a predictor of that profile. None of the things we studied were related to high cortisol throughout the day. But what we did find is also this thing that we've been calling, or people call blunted cortisol, kids who don't show an elevation in the morning. And um, this is not uncommonly found in kids who are exposed to chronic stress or adversity. Um, so um, what, the, what cortisol in the morning is doing is rising as you're still sleeping. It's rising to this elevation in the morning that gets you awake and alert and functioning and your cognitive functioning on like at the right level. So kids who are at having this blunted level are starting their day um, um, with their brains unprepared to function through the day. Um, so we found that disrupted diurnal pattern um, much more commonly among kids in poverty. 23% um, of the kids in poverty displayed that um, pattern as opposed to 6% in kids not in poverty, and that's not accounting for other risk factors. Um, and having that disrupted diurnal pattern was related to significantly lower effortful control. Um, this was, again, the data from our small sample because we didn't use cutoffs in our bigger sample, um, but um, similar pattern in our bigger sample. And then we um, have data on our kids over time. So um, these are their diurnal cortisol patterns once every nine months from three to five and a half. And what we see is predominantly a pattern of stability. Um, kids who um, were at about the average range, on, and this one is particularly morning level, stay there. Kids who started had this blunted profile pretty much stayed there over those two and a half years. You didn't see a lot of change, a little bit, but not a lot. So again, I thought, oh shoot, we caught these kids too late at three? Seriously? It looks that way. So the other system that um, we looked at is called RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. It's thought to be a really good indicator of emotion regulation. It's the parasympathetic system, or indicator of parasympathetic system activity that brings your body back to a homeostatic state after arousal. Um, and again, at basal levels, having a high variable heart rate in general suggests a system that's responsive and flexible to experience. And so it's, um, high variable heart rate is um, an indicator of high RSA. I'm sorry, the low variable heart rate. I did say high. Low variable heart rate is an indicator of high RSA or a high invariable heart rate, a high heart rate that doesn't change much to experience is um, low RSA or poor regulation. Because we know that this is studied in infants and it's an indicator of emotion regulation as early as infancy, we thought that this might be shaped by stress and experience and that it could interfere with the development of executive function. Uh, we didn't find that. Um, mostly it didn't relate to income, um, which we were surprised about. It did develop um, over this period, so kids are improving in their own parasympathetic regulation of arousal, which is great, um, but we weren't seeing it, the relation with income that we had hoped to see, nor was it related to um, ethical control, which I'll show you right now. So again, we were interested in how these might, these other indicators of self-regulation might impact the development of effortful control when effortful control is developing precipitously 
in the um, preschool period and um, RSA pretty stable already in this early childhood period um, and not really having much of an impact. Um, so, you know, we're researchers, we'll grasp onto anything. Um, I saw this trend towards an effect here. So it makes me wonder, oh, might its impact be more relevant later in childhood? We might look for that. We might um, perhaps be seeing uh, something like a hyperreactive period in preschool. That is, the RSA sy system is not as um, reactive or sensitive to environmental input at this age as in other periods. So worth exploring. There you go. There's a research project for you. Um, but as expected, um, cortisol regulation, uh, diurnal regulation of the um, HPA axis system was closely related to effortful control. Most people will say and study, and I, was the, I did this too at first, that um, cortisol regulation impacts effortful control development. But what our data suggests is very bidirectional. And even at the earliest time point, we see more of an effective effortful control on HPA axis than by vice versa. We also see effortful control pretty stable already at this point compared to the HPA axis. I wouldn't make, make too much of these numbers growing, but they are growing, so the stability it may be coming more trait-like or more stable um, during this preschool period. So that's the part of the self-regulation that's within the child. Then we obviously wanted to start looking outside the child. Um, indirect effects of income on outcomes through this system. Okay, so I'm going to, yeah. Yeah. It's actually quite stable in a sample when you look at the full range of income. So from one time point to the next, our correlation is about 0 0.8 to 8 to 9. Um, same with cumulative risk. So we, we had intended or planned on modeling um, income as a time varying covariate, but it just blew up our models because of this, you know, so I think income varies a lot in the margins, but then when you look between poverty and uh, someone making $150,000, $200,000 a year, um, the shifts across large spans are small, so then the correlation across time ends up being quite big, at least in our sample. Um, like yeah, so we didn't, so we tend, we were, we were analyzing this, um, long, I mean, uh, continuously, income is continuous in our, I know I was, I was presenting data with categories, I'm sorry, yeah, now I see what you're asking. Uh, in these analyses, it's all continuous. We did look, um, we did look um, at um, trying to include, po in one, I think in one analysis, we did include poverty as a time, varying, like just poverty status as a time varying um, covariate um, that didn't, uh, predict a lot over the full range of income. So really, and what we also found is um, the difference between poverty or at or near, po I mean, near poverty and even at 200% poverty were pretty negligible. It was really, you didn't really start seeing meaningful differences until you hit that median income and above. So yeah, sorry, I didn't um, get your question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is try to summarize the results of like three or four studies um, in, with a perspective that I have now that I wish I had when I wrote those papers. So we wrote these like papers sequentially and we kind of did pieces of it. And then I like, now I can look back and tell a better story than I did. So I'm not gonna talk study by study, even though I just wanted to just show you that all of these analyses are done um, off, you know, looking at like um, a, a later time point controlling for a prior time point or using growth modeling where we're looking at an initial level and in linear growth um, or including um, uh, mediators in a growth modeling. Um, so these are all, you know, different varieties of growth models or path models that we've tested and published in different papers. And then in the end of it all, I felt like I understood what I was studying a little bit better. So, um, okay, so as I already said, income and cumul income, low income was related to higher cumulative risk. Um, both of those were related to um, dysregulation of the HPA axis or the cortisol system. Um, and to lower effortful or executive control. Um, neither was related to RSA. And also, as I already showed you, that these are um, interrelated with each other, that they're influencing each other um, over time. And each is having um, an implication for child outcomes. So cortisol 
was related, cortisol dysregulation was related to more behavior emotional problems, um, and then executive control was related to all the outcomes we were looking at, behavior problems, um, academic readiness, social emotional competence. But what we were really interested in all of this was what role parenting plays either mediating or moderating these effects. Um, so just really quick to zoom in on parenting, um, both this is, no, this is nothing new. We know low income is related to less effective parenting in general. Cumulative risk is related to less effective parenting in general. Um, and that's what we found. So income is related to less warmth, less consistent limit setting, less use of scaffolding. And I'll describe these in a minute. Whereas cumulative risk is related to more negativity in the parents and less scaffolding. But I'm struck by, we should all be struck by, how moderate these associations are. These are not whopping associations that while having these stressful environments is relating to less effective parenting, this is not a one-to-one -one relation, that there are a lot of parents who are sustaining really good parenting in the context of low income and cumulative risk. And that's a really important insight for us to have when we think about working with families in these contexts. Um, nonetheless, um, income, uh, parenting did mediate almost fully or completely the effects of income and cumulative risk on children's self-regulation. So the, it pretty much wipes out the direct effects. Um, that, that's consistent with that idea that the more distal factors will have their impact through proximal factors and that those proximal relationship factors in a young child's life have the biggest impact on their development. Um, so um, our measures that predicted this prefrontal cortex aspect of self-regulation executive control were really the parts of parenting that represent providing structuring guidance, predictability. Um, so consistent limit setting is making your expectations for your child in our study, these were observational measures of parenting, we coded parent behaviors, making expectations as clear as possible and when the child didn't meet expectations following through with uh, a directive or a reprimand or a consequence um, and doing so consistently. Scaffolding was being able to provide guidance and structuring but also autonomy I should say and, and also autonomy, so supporting the child's independence and not being intrusive, not over controlling. So scaffolding is um, my nightmare as a parent. This idea of very carefully balancing or titrating your level of guidance and structuring with your level of letting your child be free and autonomous and really understanding when they need you to step in and when they don't, holy cow. I don't know any of us who do that really well, but scaffolding was really most strongly related to growth and executive control. The kids who had parents who were higher in scaffolding started the study higher in, effortful con in executive control and ended the sty uh, study higher. So um, even though other kids were growing, these kids started higher and ended higher. And uh, if you want advice on how to be a parent who does more scaffolding, don't come to me. because <laughs> Not my forte. Uh, the other um, thing that was interesting is how much specificity there was in this prediction. So while these aspects of control or structuring predicted um, the development of executive function, when we control for all of the parenting dimensions, warmth and negativity didn't relate to executive control. Rather, warmth and particularly negativity were related to the regulation of the neuroendocrine stress response system. So in especially, I have um, warmth in there as a dotted line. In one analysis, um, depending on what other things are in the model, it's a trend, but in another one, it's significant. So when families, when parents were able to maintain a warm, um, positive, um, loving relationship, a nurturing relationship with their kids, and had very low, harsh, critical behaviors towards their child in our observations, the kids had better regulated neuroendocrine st stress response systems. And people are out, um, there are some people um, in the literature referring to negativity as another form of toxic stress or negative affect in parents as a form of toxic stress for young kids. So that specificity I thought was um, interesting and I didn't see it until I started presenting like across our studies. Um, okay, so remember those moderate associations with income and cumulative risk. We were also thinking it's really important if we're gonna get out there and start saying we're gonna do parent interventions with low income families because parents can be protective in their context of risk. We need to know that really if parents are sustaining warm and positive parenting. Is that making the difference? Is that really overcoming the impacts of low income and cumulative risk on kids? So we were looking at moderated effects. That's a moderation question. When a parent sustains 
effective parenting in the context of high risk, does that make a difference? And our data suggests it does. It's not a clean picture. I wish these were really pretty protective um, interactions, but they're not. Um, so what we want to do is ignore what happens at the low risk end, because I really can't understand what's happening there. Um, but at the high risk end, or maybe I just don't want to explain what's happening there. Uh, at the high risk end, um, so this is more than uh, at or above one standard deviation on the cumulative risk measure. When parents are lower in scaffolding, their kids have lower academic readiness and lower social competence. When parents are higher in scaffolding, the kids are higher in academic readiness and higher in social competence. Um, so sustaining something like or, or supporting something like scaffolding in families um, in these high risk or adverse contexts um, can protect children from the adversity they're experiencing. But we go in there and we say, okay, parents do this great scaffolding, do this great warm, low negative behavior. In the meantime, they have that list of risk factors that I listed, the stress that goes along with um, low income and cumulative risk. And so um, it seems like we're missing an important aspect of what we're, how to work with, um, with these families. So we had a great conversation this morning with some students and last night about how um, it feels like you really can't do this work um, as a clinical psychologist on an individual or individual-based interventions without really also thinking about the systems that are, those families are in. So I recognize that up front. And um, also, I continue to be a child clinical psychologist, so I do my work anyway. Um, so we want to promote warmth and scaffolding and consistency. But we also um, were thinking that we really need to do something to break that link between um, low income and cumulative risk and the stress that parents are experiencing, their own emotion um, reactions, their stress and emotion dysregulation. So we thought it was really important to insert or cultivate an aspect of mindfulness and emotion regulation in the parenting um, work that we do to help parents um, engage with their kids in, in the way that's that we all want to, you know, that kind of in the effective way we all want to be. So how many of us don't go home, those of us who have kids don't go home from a bad day and behave in a way we didn't want to, um, short tempered or disengaged or whatever. So we can all imagine that it would take some special tools to engage positively with our kids in a context of stress. So that's what we did. We um, were thinking about how to incorporate mindfulness in parenting work that we were um, aiming to do. Why mindfulness? There's good evidence. I don't know. I should probably don't have to talk to this crowd about that. But there's good evidence of its effect on adult executive function, improving emotional regulation and stress responses, and improving mental health. These were the things we wanted to support in parents um, so that they could um, engage in more effective parenting. Your own Larissa Duncan is the leader in the field in defining what mindfulness in parenting looks like and what kind of um, support it gives to um, more sensitive and responsive um, emotionally aware and regulated parenting. Um, and as far as I know, other than correlational studies and a few demonstration projects, there isn't a lot of good evidence in randomized control trials, just one that I know of that also Larissa Duncan was part of, um, that really evaluates the benefit of mindfulness to parenting programs. And so that's an important direction that we need to go. Um, oh, Rob was part of that too. Um, and, but we know that when parents describe themselves as either using mindfulness or being more um, higher in a trait mindfulness, they describe themselves, they report be, being, um, having lower stress, better emotional regulation, better parenting. There's some evidence that it augments, you know, individual treatment with kids, um, some increasing evidence of it um, benefiting or augmenting interventions, but we really need more rigorous evidence of its um, contribution. Um, I think, uh, you guys here are doing some of the first, uh, you know, earliest um, randomized control trials that I know of, right, Julie? So um, there are also considerations in thinking about um, bringing something like a mindfulness approach to individuals who've experienced adversity or trauma in their past, who are in um, low-income settings or have um, different um, cultural or racial backgrounds. So this is just an example of a focus group study that was done. There are other studies that have similar, um, I don't want to call them warnings, but suggestions that we take into account. So um, people, when we think about traditional mindfulness-based um, training programs, 
Um, they're often two and a half hours for eight weeks plus a retreat, and they have this request or requirement of at least 45 minutes a day of meditating. And so when you present this to a community that has, this is a study of African-American women who have a history of adversity and trauma, and the kinds of things they tell us is two and a half hours is too long, um, sitting still is challenging because of pain and, dis and feeling agitation, closing eyes during meditation with other people in the room feels threatening, um, practicing a body scan where you're, you're supposed to be paying attention to body parts in a room with other people is threatening. Um, it may be perceived as conflicting with religious beliefs. Uh, people may have low understanding or familiarity with this idea, so they're concerned about it. Um, and that really we might want to relax the expectation that people be meditating for 30 to 45 minutes a day. Um, that would be hard for almost any of us to insert in our day, and that might feel overwhelming to families who have a lot going on. Um, but they expressed goals to want to learn how to relax, how to cope better, manage their stress better, take better care of themselves. So their goals are consistent with the things we'd want to do in um, bringing mindfulness programs to um, for a community like this. So in all that, we decided to create a parenting program rather than adopting or adapting one um, because um, we were trying to also meet some of the needs we were hearing in the community such that, like such as the length of existing programs is often eight to 12 weeks and that feels too long. So we created a program that was six weeks that um, it had to be more easily readily integrated into already existing learn early learning programs, otherwise it would never get adopted. So we we're trying to meet other demands and in, um, and in infusing mindfulness in a parenting program, we really wanted to think about how do we take practices, mindfulness practices that are right immediately integrated with the parenting practices. So that it's not like a parent feels like they're learning and having to practice mindfulness and then learning and having to practice good parenting, but that they were um, connected or one and the same. Um, so we were targeting warmth, scaffolding and consistency based on our research and lots of other people's research. Um, we were infusing them with informal or everyday mindfulness and self-regulation or emotion regulation practices and put, putting those two together. Our hope is that we would impact child executive function in this and social emotional outcomes. Um, we don't have data on that yet. Um, and uh, we've tried to make it short. I can't, I can't bring myself to make it shorter than six weeks, but maybe someday we'll, we'll try. And um, we're told there's even too much in the six groups. so. Um, we'll have to cut even more. Um, and we were thinking about a tiered approach too, that for families who might need much more intensive work or need more support or help around incorporating either the mindfulness or the parenting practices that they could be um, augmented with home coaching sessions. So, so far we've done these with two home sessions, but you could go like four um, also. So those would be more individualized um, troubleshooting sessions. So um, we used what are commonly used practices in behavioral parenting approaches. So we did this took a Bruce Trapita modular approach, take out what are the, we know are the effective things across parenting programs, and then connected them with a uh, mindfulness practice. So for example, um, child-led time or time where the child gets to pick what she does or he does with you is pretty common across behavioral parenting interventions. We asked parents to practice a new kind of mindfulness practice that, or use a different kind of mindfulness practice during that time where we call it a noticing practice and we just run them through this practice of noticing your child's eyes, noticing your child's face, noticing their posture. And so we tell them even though you might not have fun doing playing what your child is playing, we hope that you can find some joy or enjoyment in just noticing your child in what they're doing during child-led time. So it's sort of a reframe of that time. And since we are asking you to spend 10 minutes a day with your child anyway, you get a twofer. You get to practice meditate or mindfulness and practice child-led time at the same time. So that was the idea that we kind of worked throughout the parenting practices. We incorporated wise mind in scaffolding. Um, we incorporated emotion regulation strategies in handling diff difficult <coughs> situations and being consistent, using consistent limit setting when there are misbehaviors. So that was the idea. We have a couple, I don't even know what to call these, feasibility, piloting kind of things, no comparison groups. Um, we did them in two different settings. One is a early learning um, support setting in a rural area part of Washington, and the other was an urban Head Start um, preschool 
um, setting and we um, did pretty light training, a couple days of training with the already existing parenting educators in those settings. We leaned heavily on the fact that they were probably already experts in parenting and we were really just trying to teach them what we were trying to teach them. It went along with weekly um, consultation and supervision through the process. Um, so we have some small samples, 24 families in the rural setting, 17 in the Head Start setting, all out or near poverty, and we collected a bunch of measures. Um, what we were just excited about was, at least in um, the sample we've analyzed so far, we see the parenting moving in the direction that we want it to. Um, a couple of these effects, even with small samples, are significant. Not that significance is big, but these are um, the, um, the uh, standard deviation change in the outcomes. So they would be significant if we had um, a bigger sample. Um, so it's encouraging, but we're cautious because, we, like I said, we don't have comparison groups. We haven't done a randomized trial yet. Um, despite our parent educators' concerns, families were largely positive about the programs. They often told us that they were grateful for the practices like paced breathing um, or wise mind because not, not a lot of them, they said they were using them with their kids, but almost all of them said they were using them with uh, uh, their boss or a coworker or someone else who was stressing them out. So um, I think they understood that these were um, tools they could use in any setting. <coughs> so we'd love to do a randomized control trial if you have any ideas about funding. Um, we really, not only does it actually improve parenting, but does adding mindfulness to behavioral programs change child outcomes? That's the question. That's the million dollar question because, or it would cost about a million dollars to test it maybe. But, um, <laughs> but why go through the hassle of updating or changing parenting programs and especially why go through the hassle of training people in something as complicated or um, as mindfulness, maybe it doesn't have to be complicated, but if it's not actually changing child outcomes. So that's um, the um, thing that we think is the next step. I'd love to see more integration of mindfulness and behavioral parenting approaches. There's 30, 40 years of research on <coughs> behavioral parenting approaches, so no need to throw those out. Um, and really trying to understand more about what, how we would adapt or alter our programs to um, be sensitive to the different um, racial or ethnic or cultural groups that we're working with. So stepping back from the intervention um, and thinking about the whole body of research, um, we, think that we see, lots of people are seeing this too, that low income and cumulative risk really set off this cascade of dysregulation in um, neurobiological systems underlying self-regulation um, and that these systems are, are you know, also shaping each other. So you can see this as a snowballing effect over time. Um, and it has implications for health and mental health and social emotional outcomes in kids. Um, in early childhood, parenting is a critical mediator and moderator of these effects, so a critical regulating force in a child's life. That it's really, parenting is shaping these um, regulation systems in kids. Um, so it's useful to think about supporting parents in a context like this, but really needing to take into account the family's context, thinking about their um, adversity and the um, effects of mental health or other problems and not just ignoring those. We can't just walk in and say, we're gonna do better parenting without really attending to the larger context that families are facing. Um, so we wanna address parent stress and self-regulation through mindfulness and emotion regulation tools, as well as integrating behavioral and mindfulness practices. And then a question, it came up this morning in our conversation with students, a question that I have is this idea of when, how long can effective parenting have an impact of reversing the effect of early experiences of in low income and adversity on kids? Um, it, can it be a key force in seeing a reversal of the impact of early adversity? Um, and we don't actually know for how long or to what extent parenting would continue to have this impact of altering these regulation systems. Is it until kids are 10, until they're 13, until they're 18? Um, and so I think that'd be a useful next direction. Um, that I would like to pursue. That's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, and I welcome any thoughts or questions or conversation.